The Holy Bible is by far the most amazing book of all ages. Written in a time span of over 1500 years, comprised of 66 books by 40 different authors, all speaking in one voice about one God. Authors that range from the lowly homeless prophets and fishermen on up to kings. This fascinating work of art is not a collection of serendipitous fairy tales and fables, but a book of sacred oracles that have stood the test of time. The Bible, history's all-time bestseller, has continued to be the authority on such matters as law, science, history, politics, health, family, finances, and even sanitation. It's the human being's life manual, so to speak. Much blood has been shed over this word from God. Many have given their lives to preserve it or to follow what it teaches. Though much has been written about Bible prophecy, the Bible remains the best source for understanding its prophecies. Bible prophecy has been 100% accurate 100% of the time. This video focuses on the fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled prophecies. This video also points out some of the biggest misunderstandings about what the Bible teaches. So grab your Bible and a notebook for an amazing journey through Bible prophecy. The first three chapters of the Bible in Genesis takes us through the creation of the heavens, earth, and all that is in them, the paradise-like setting that was once ours to possess, and the fall of mankind into sin. The last three chapters of the Bible in Revelation takes us through the redemption of mankind back to an even better paradise than that which was once lost. The fact is, we can know the future. We can prepare and know what to expect all by reading and understanding the prophecies in the Bible. Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plan to His servants, the prophets. The book of Daniel is an excellent place to begin reviewing the fulfillment of these prophecies. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of an enormous statue that outlined the history of the world from Nebuchadnezzar to the end. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by a human hand. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom of Babylon was the head of gold in the statue, lasting from about 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. The kingdom of the Medes and Persians is represented by the chest and arms of silver, lasting a little longer from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. Greece, represented by the bronze belly and thighs, lasted even longer from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Rome is represented by the Iron Legs. This kingdom lasted from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., the reigning power during the time of Jesus. This kingdom would weaken and become divided as iron and clay mixed, and then be divided into ten divisions represented by the ten toes. History has shown these to be Alemanni, now known as Germany, Franks, now France, Burgundian, now Switzerland, Suevi, now Portugal, Lombards, now Italy, Visigoths, now Spain, Anglo-Saxons, now England. The Vandals, Heruli, and Ostrogoths were all destroyed. These divisions would last from 476 AD to Christ's second coming. The destruction of the Vandals, Heruli, and Ostrogoths were predicted in the next prophecy. In Daniel chapter 7, 
Daniel is given a vision that covers the same thing Nebuchadnezzar's dream covered. This time, instead of a statue, four beasts are used. Beast and prophecy represent kingdoms. This will be necessary to understand for future prophecies as well. Here's the text. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beast, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. In this amazing prophecy, we're filled in on some details that were not included in the first prophecy of the statue. These kingdoms would spring up at the Great Sea, which is known today as the Mediterranean Sea. Water in prophecy also represents heavily populated areas. The first beast, the lion, is Babylon, the head of gold in the previous prophecy. Some elaboration is given on the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar that can be found in chapter 4 of Daniel. The second beast, the bear, is the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, the silver arms and chest of the previous prophecy. Being raised on one side indicates the superior status of the Persians in the Medo-Persian alliance. The three ribs in the bear's mouth represents its three principal conquests, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. The leopard is the kingdom of Greece, the bronze belly and thighs of the previous prophecy. The four wings represent the speedy conquest of Alexander the Great, the four heads representing the four main divisions into which his kingdom fell after his untimely death. The fourth beast, the terrifying and frightening beast, is the Roman Empire and that in which it disintegrates and evolves into. It's the iron legs and the iron clay mixture of the feet and toes of the previous prophecy. The ten horns correspond to the ten toes of the statue prophecy. As history has shown, three of those kingdoms no longer exist, as mentioned earlier. This prophecy foretells the uprooting of these three divisions and the arrival of the Antichrist in its place, represented by the little horn with the eyes and mouth that spoke boastfully. Later in chapter 7, Daniel is given an explanation of this fourth beast that was different from the others. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. 
Take note that three and a half years are mentioned here. Time, times, and half a time. Also note that this Antichrist power tries to change the set times and laws. This will play out later in the video. This power will also persecute God's people and will be in place until God removes them at the end of time. Now let's move on to the vision given to Daniel in chapter 8. In this prophecy we see more information given. This time the prophecy begins with Medo-Persia represented by the ram. The final world powers from Greece to the Antichrist are represented by the goat and its horns. I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power his large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south, and to the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Daniel is given the interpretation later in the chapter. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Medea and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. It's important to understand Bible prophecy covers the same events over and over again in different ways. This offers perspective and detail. Yet not understanding this biblical concept actually shrouds the meanings of the prophecies in confusion. More information is given about this power in Revelation. You will notice the similarities between the little horn that sprang up amongst the ten horns in Daniel 7 and the sea beast of Revelation 13. The same rules apply to all biblical prophecies. A beast is simply a kingdom. Here's the text. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast come out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. 
The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for forty-two months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place in those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. The three and a half years or forty-two months this power rules are the same according to the 360-day Jewish calendar. They both state he will blaspheme God. They both state he will persecute the saints. Revelation is simply giving us more information about the prophecies we read in Daniel. If these prophecies seem confusing, let's take a moment to clarify some things and put a face on the Antichrist before we move on to what will happen and the role America will play. Let's start with the tabernacle or sanctuary. The tabernacle on earth was to be a representation of the heavenly sanctuary. That's why Moses in the Old Testament had so many instructions to follow in constructing the very first sanctuary. But the sanctuary of the Lord can also be seen as a blueprint for the Christian life, among other things. The first place you come to in the sanctuary is the courtyard. And the courtyard was located in an altar to burn sacrifices and a laver to wash in. The courtyard is a wonderful illustration of justification. Everyone is eligible to come as they are to the altar to accept Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, symbolized by the altar, and be baptized in his name, symbolized by the water and the laver. The next area you come to in the sanctuary is the holy place. The items found in the holy place included bread, candlesticks, and the altar of incense. The holy place illustrates the part of the Christian life we would call sanctification. This is where God begins transforming our lives through the Word, Jesus represented by the bread, the truth, Jesus represented by the light, and prayer, Jesus interceding for us as our high priest represented by the incense. Jesus claimed to be all of these and more in the New Testament. Then we come to the most holy place. The most holy place is where the glory of God and His holy law were located. This most holy place illustrates the process of glorification which happens at the resurrection of the righteous. Here we receive our glorified bodies as we are physically united with Jesus. When Jesus gave his life for everyone, the curtain separating the most holy place from the holy place was torn top to bottom. This marked an end to the old system of atonement and the beginning of the new covenant fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus became the temple. We as Christians are part of the new temple on earth, individually and collectively. The heavenly sanctuary remains in heaven. Here are a few examples of this change. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. When Jesus drove out the merchants in the temple at the start of his ministry, Jesus said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? At this time, Jesus still referred to the temple on earth as his father's house. But just before his crucifixion, Jesus said, Look, your house is left to you desolate. So the temple went from being a structure or building to being people, worshippers of the Most High God.
Understanding this transition from the Old to New Covenant is a key to understanding end-time prophecies and identifying the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. God's law, the Ten Commandments, was written with his finger in stone, as well as in our hearts, and placed inside the Ark of the Covenant that was in the most holy place on the planet. The ceremonial commandments and laws were written by Moses on paper and kept outside the Ark of the Covenant which too was in the most holy place on the planet. Having cancelled the written code with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible today. Many apply this to the Ten Commandments. Applying it this way would put this passage in direct contradiction to the teachings of Jesus himself. The word Sabbath in this passage is used as a synonym for holiday, not for the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. This becomes very clear when you examine the language used. Did Jesus make a public spectacle of the Father? Did Jesus disarm the Father? Of course not. Jesus made a public spectacle of the hypocritical religious leaders. It was the leaders he disarmed. There are two other instances in Paul's writings that talk on the same subject, but are commonly misinterpreted or applied to the Sabbath commandment. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. This chapter begins by referring to disputable matters, not essential doctrine. The religious leaders were keeping the people in bondage with all their rules and regulations. This is what Paul is addressing. Yet this wasn't an isolated incident of the New Testament. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. You see, every scripture used today to support changing the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday comes from Paul's writings. The Apostle Peter actually warned us about the writings of Paul being misunderstood. It seems they were already being misused in the first century as they are today. Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. Notice he uses the term lawless. Two thousand years later, we're having the same problem. Preachers telling us it doesn't matter which day we keep holy, saying there is no difference between Saturday and Sunday, blurring the line between the holy and the common. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean and they shut their eyes to the keeping of my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Pastors teaching their church that the law has been done away with and that we're not under law, we're under grace. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Indeed, if you're watching this video, heaven and earth have not passed away. Is the law bondage? Is it burdensome? Or is it freedom? But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. 
bless them. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Freedom. This is love for God, to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are law for themselves, even though they do not have the law since they show the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Prophesying of this new covenant that would be fulfilled in Jesus, the Old Testament says, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. The scripture was quoted word for word in Hebrews 8.10 of the New Testament. Not only did Jesus live the perfect sin-free life, but he gave us power over sin. Believers are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. God's law is a reflection of his unchanging character and will for his people. Keep in mind, if there is no law, there is no sin, there is no need for a savior. Sin is the transgression of the law. This is Satan's primary objective, to hurt God through the sins of his children. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Notice that Jesus takes away our sin, not the law. Let's take a look at an amazing biblical comparison between the attributes of God and his holy law. According to the scriptures, God and his holy law are both good, holy, just, perfect, love righteous, true, pure, spiritual, unchangeable, eternal, and light. Jesus took the commandments even further when he said that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Or for murder, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. This is the spirit of the law. If you're keeping the spirit of the law, the letter of the law will be kept as well. Jesus was simply explaining how all sin begins. It starts from within. It's ultimately Jesus who makes it possible to keep his commandments. Believe in Jesus and he will cover our past sins, restore us to God, Give us the desire to please God. Help us to please God. Remove our death sentence. And keep us through temptations and trials. We don't obey the commandments of God to get into heaven. Jesus already paid our way. We obey out of thanksgiving and love. Our obedience is an outward sign of our inner transformation. True lovers of God and truth strive to obey Him 100% of the time. We can expect the devil to tempt the children of God into breaking His law in some way or another. This has always been His main objective. If the three Hebrew boys had bowed to the golden image, it would have broken the second commandment. If Daniel had prayed to the king as instructed, he would have broken the first commandment. So the man of lawlessness will be a religious leader that downplays the importance of keeping the law in some way. But we don't have to guess who this is. Let's explore what the Bible says about this. In Revelation 13, 1 through 10 and 15 through 18 alone, God gives 10 clues to help us identify the beast. 
Beasts and prophecy represent kingdoms or powers, just as we saw it used in Daniel. He gives us a long list of characteristics so that we can be absolutely certain of the beast's identity. Point 1. Rises up out of the sea. 2. Receives its power, seat, and authority from the dragon. 3. Becomes a worldwide power. 4. Is guilty of blasphemy. 5. Rules for 42 prophetic months. 6. Receives a deadly wound that heals. 7. Is a religious power for it receives worship. 8. Persecutes God's saints. 9. Has the mysterious number 666. And 10. Is led by one supreme man. There's only one power that fits all 10 of these identifying marks. The papacy. That's right, the institution of the Catholic Church. At this time, it's important to note that God has his children in many religious persuasions and denominations. This is not speaking of Catholics as individuals, but the ungodly institution and some of what it teaches. It's certainly not the intention of this video to offend anyone. Please prayerfully consider what you're about to see. The idea of the Catholic Church being the Antichrist is by no means a new idea. This has been understood for hundreds of years by some of the most respected Christian minds that have ever lived. Martin Luther, former Catholic priest and father of the Lutheran Church. John Calvin, father of the Presbyterian Church. John Wesley, father of the Methodist Church. Thomas Kramer. John Knox. Roger Williams. Jonathan Edwards, Isaac Newton, John Bunyan, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Although these men may have disagreed on some of their understanding of doctrine, they all agreed on one important point. They all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. That's because the evidence is overwhelming. But in order to be certain, we will carefully consider the points one at a time. Point 1. Rises up out of the sea. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw, where the prostitute sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. In prophecy, water represents great multitudes of people or heavily populated areas. The papacy arose in populated Western Europe. So it fits point one. Point two receives its power, seat, and authority from the dragon. According to Revelations 12, 3 through 5, the dragon is the power that sought to destroy the child Jesus at the time of his birth. It was Satan who inspired Herod, a king for the pagan Roman Empire, to slay all the male babies in Bethlehem. To whom did pagan Rome give her authority in capital city? To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. Point two fifth. Point three becomes a worldwide power. No one would question that during the Middle Ages, the papacy was indeed a worldwide power. In fact, the word Catholic means universal. To this day, the Catholic Church remains the most influential religious power on the planet. Point three fits as well. Four is guilty of blasphemy. The Bible defines blasphemy as man claiming to forgive sins and claiming to be God. Is the Catholic Church guilty of such blasphemy? The Pope and God are the same, so he has all power in heaven and earth. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. This judicial authority will even include the power to forgive sin. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. As we learned earlier, we are the temple of God. Misunderstanding the scripture has led many modern religionists into thinking the temple must be rebuilt. 
So this entity will set himself up over the followers of Christ as God. According to their own writings, they fit point four as well. Five, rules for 42 prophetic months. Remember that in prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We'll go into that later in this video. This time period is repeatedly referred to in prophecy as three and a half years, 42 months, or 1260 days. Based on the Jewish calendar, all three time periods total the same 1260 prophetic days, or 1260 literal years. The worldwide power of Papal Rome became official in 538 AD, when Emperor Justinian's decree making the papacy supreme was no longer opposed. The papacy was dealt what appeared to be a death blow in 1798 when the Pope was captured by Napoleon's General Alexander Berthier. Notice the time period is precisely 1260 years as was prophesied. Point 5 only fits the papacy. 6. Receives a deadly wound that heals. In 1798 when General Berthier took the Pope captive to France where he died in exile, half of Europe thought this event signaled the end of the papacy. But God said that the wound would be healed and that the papacy's power and influence would be restored until the entire world would follow our leading. Multiplied millions worldwide looked to the papacy as the only hope for world unity, peace, and decency, precisely as God's prophets foretold. The papacy clearly fits point six. Seven is a religious power for it receives worship. It is obvious that this entity would be involved in spiritual matters. The words worship or worshipped are used five times in Revelation 13 in reference to this power. Eight persecutes God's saints. Many people are shocked to find out that the Catholic Church has persecuted and destroyed more Protestants than anyone else in history. Pope Nicholas I writes, Fear then our wrath and the thunders of our vengeance, for Jesus Christ has appointed us with his own mouth absolute judges of all men, and kings themselves are submitted to our authority. British historian William Edward Lecky wrote, The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. For professing faith contrary to the teachings of the Church of Rome, history records the martyrdom of more than 100 million people. On August 24, 1527, Roman Catholics in France, by prearranged plan under Jesuit influence, murdered 70,000 Protestants within the space of two months. The Pope rejoiced when he heard the news of the successful outcome. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Point 9 has the mysterious number 666. One of the Pope's official titles is Vicar of the Son of God, which is Vicarius Philade in Latin, the official language of the Church. The book of Revelation is saying that we can somehow calculate the number of his name. Will the Roman numeral value of his title equal 666? Let's see. The Catholic Church dismisses the claim as an anti-Catholic myth and states that popes have never possessed such a title. Yet William F. Russell, writing on behalf of James Cardinal Gibbons in 1904, said that the title was used by the cardinal who imposes the tiara at the coronation of a pope, though he couldn't say with certainty whether it appeared on the pope's tiara. Knowledge of this title equaling 666 has been circulating for hundreds of years. Though this does not point to a specific pope, just the office, in recent years new research and discovery has identified a specific pope. A link to that resource is provided at the end of this video. Point 9 fits as well. Point 10 is led by one supreme man. This would be the pope. No other religion has so much wrapped up in a man as the papacy. 
Many look to the Pope as the most holy man on earth even across denominational lines. Here are more papal writings. It is a power greater than that of monarchs and emperors. It is greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. Indeed, it is greater even than the power of the Virgin Mary. For while the Blessed Virgin was the human agency by which Christ became incarnate a single time, the priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man, not once but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. And will say unheard of things against the God of gods. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It set itself up to be as great as the Prince of the Host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Jesus' work on the cross was finished, yet the Antichrist seeks to hijack the sanctuary and continue atoning for sins his way on a daily basis. What about Daniel 7.25, speaking of the Antichrist? He will speak against the Most High, and oppress his saints, and try to change the set times and the law. The Catholic writings proclaim this virtually word for word. The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. The Pope has the authority and often exercised it to dispense with the command of Christ. The authority of the Church could therefore not be bound to the authority of Scriptures, because the Church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. When the Catholic Church is asked, why do you feel you have the power, authority, and ability to change scripture to match your traditions, they answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. And quoting the Catholic record, the Bible still teaches that the Sabbath or Saturday should be kept holy. There is no authority in the New Testament for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Surely it is an important matter. It stands there in the Bible as one of the Ten Commandments of God. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Due to the exaggerated importance given the Bible after the Reformation and the influence of Puritanism, Sunday, it is the law of the Catholic Church alone. Sunday worship is the law of the Catholic Church, the mark of their authority. And God? Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us so they would know 
that I the Lord made them holy. Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. A few Sabbath commandment facts. The Sabbath has been around since creation, when everything was still perfect. It was understood by the Israelites before the Ten Commandments were written. Speaking of manna, Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. The Sabbath will be celebrated in the new heaven and earth. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. Located in the center of the law, it's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It begins with the word remember in every translation, the only commandment having to do with time. One of three commandments that include an explanation, and it includes the seal of God. What's a seal? A seal is a mark or symbol of ownership. Historically, a seal consists of three things, name, title, and territory or domain. The seal was a mark of ownership amongst the leaders. An example of the seal would have been one that was placed on the tomb of Jesus. It would have read, Pontius Pilate, Governor, Judea. The seal on the lion's den in Daniel would have read, Darius, King, Medo-Persia. An example from the present day would be a presidential seal. It would read, George W. Bush, President. United States of America. You can find all three of these in the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Lord, his name would have originally read Jehovah or Yahweh. Made is his title as maker or creator. The heavens, the earth, and the sea is his territory. The first of the three angel messages in Revelation 14.7 uses phrasing similar to that of the fourth commandment as a warning before the final events take place. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The first of the three angel messages is no coincidence. It's clearly telling us to worship the way God intended, to worship, honor, and obey the Creator. A second angel followed and said, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. The second angel proclaims the destruction of the one responsible for leading the bride of Christ away from the worshipping of the bridegroom. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. 
The third angel warns of the consequences of worshiping the way the beast prescribes. Remember, a mark on the head represents an act of the heart or mind. A mark on the hand represents an act of works. Some may say it doesn't matter how you worship, just who you worship. Let's consider the first conflict in the Bible, the story of Cain and Abel. They both worshipped God. One did it as prescribed in obedience to God and it was accepted. The other did it his disobedient way and it was rejected. The disobedient sought the life of the obedient. Since God doesn't change, it matters who and how you worship, as well as whom you obey. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Jesus is our prime example of who we should strive to be like. What did Jesus do? He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. This was Jesus' custom, and it didn't stop right after his resurrection, as many think. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem some forty years before it was to happen, Jesus says, Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. The other argument you may hear is that the calendar has been changed, which it has, but the weekly cycle has never been affected by any change. This is easily confirmed with a little research. Also keep in mind that there have always been Sabbath keepers from the beginning until now. The word for Saturday in 105 languages is Sabbath. There's no doubt about what day of the week this is. So when and how exactly was it changed? The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday is a constitution of Constantine in 321 AD, enacting that all courts of justice, inhabitants of towns, and workshops were to be at rest on Sunday. You may ask how it got from Constantine of pagan Rome into the Church of Papal Rome. It's all in the history books. Constantine is best remembered in modern times for the Edict of Milan in 313, which fully legalized Christianity in the Empire for the first time. Constantine of pagan Rome was responsible for the change. The church just made it official. Constantine issued laws conflicting with the Fourth Commandment, changing the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday to coincide with the Sun Worship Day of Rest. Constantine's motives for promoting the pagan influence on Christianity are not certain. His mutual compensation was possibly for political purposes of gaining favor or out of ignorance of the laws of the Bible. From God the Creator worship to Sun Worship. Does this still seem okay? Do you see how breaking the fourth commandment by making Sunday the primary day of worship causes you to break the first of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. The Lord's Day of the Bible is Saturday. Who are worshippers calling Lord on Sunday when they refer to it as the Lord's Day? You may tell yourself this is nonsense, but remember, you worship the one whom you obey. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there, at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar, were about twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. Only God knows the heart. Sunday worshipers that worship out of ignorance are different than those who deliberately disobey the word of God. We can expect to see many Sunday worshipers in heaven, but God will certainly not hold a person guiltless that hears the truth of his word, then rejects it to follow man. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Some think, how can the majority of religious leaders be wrong? Did the religious leaders in the time of Jesus accept or reject him? Not only did the religious leaders reject him, but the majority of the Jews rejected him as well. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Three out of the crowd of people willing to obey God rather than man. But God was pleased and protected them. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. How could the devil lead the whole world astray unless he attacks the church covertly from within? What if he says, worship your God? Just don't do it like you were told. Worship Sunday in honor of Jesus, like Easter every Sunday. God will be pleased because we did it for Jesus. But will he? Just think of how Jesus finished his work on the cross Good Friday, rested the Sabbath, and rose Sunday morning, keeping the Sabbath even in his work of redemption. The Strong's Concordance has this to say about the word Sabbath. For the first three centuries of the Christian era, the day of the week was never confounded with the Sabbath. The confusion of the Jewish and Christian institutions was due to declension from apostolic teaching. In other words, the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath didn't come about for hundreds of years. The Christians got away from the teachings of the apostles, who were taught by our Lord and Savior Jesus and also wrote the New Testament. There's no shortage of explanations out there of why we observe the first day instead of the seventh day. But there's no scriptural basis for it. Some may interpret Paul's writings in a way that makes it seem okay to change it. But there's absolutely no scripture saying to change it. A layman reading the Bible cover to cover would never come to the conclusion that it's okay to change it. It's the so-called wise and learned that have accepted this change, and they remain confident in their own wisdom to continue to disobey the fourth commandment despite the Bible's clear instruction. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. As Protestants, we failed to abandon this false teaching in the Reformation when we separated ourselves from the other unbiblical doctrines. What if the Sabbath commandment is the least important of God's ten main commandments? Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Note that these two examples come from the New Testament. So why has the truth been thrown down for so long? Does the Catholic Church know they're the Antichrist? This was written nearly 500 years ago by Pope Leo X. No person shall preach without the permission of his superior. All preachers shall explain the gospel according to the fathers. They shall not explain futurity or the times of Antichrist. Notice how they love to be called father. What does Jesus say about this? And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Let's examine some other scriptures concerning this Antichrist power. As mentioned earlier, a day in prophecy is a literal year. An example of this principle is found twice in the Old Testament scriptures of Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34. But the best example comes from Jesus himself in Luke when he is told Herod wants to kill him. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. This was six months into Jesus' ministry. Jesus continued his ministry for another three years, not days, totaling three and a half years. The 70 Weeks of Daniel 
Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Anointed One, the Ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the Anointed One will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Seventy sevens is 490 years. The decree to restore the temple was issued in 457 BC. There will be seven sevens. It took seven sevens or 49 years to complete the temple. And 62 sevens. The 62 sevens or the 434 years brings us to the baptism of Jesus in 27 AD. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. This brings our total to 483 years, leaving us with one seven or seven years left. Many Christians today take the remaining seven years of this prophecy and move it to the end of time. This is where the seven-year tribulation is derived. The scriptures never mention a seven-year tribulation. The following section is also where they get the idea that the Antichrist will sign a seven-year peace agreement. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. The subject of this prophecy is Jesus. He's the Prince of the Covenant, Daniel 11.22, not the Antichrist. As was mentioned earlier, Jesus' ministry to the Jews was three and a half years long, at which time he was crucified. The Anointed One will be cut off the remaining three and a half years of the prophecy is speaking of the disciples taking the gospel to the Jews, ending with the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, totaling seven years. Three and a half years from our Lord Jesus and three and a half years from the Holy Spirit-inspired disciples. After this rejection from the Jews, the gospel went to the Gentiles. In the middle of this seven-year period, the curtain in the temple was ripped top to bottom, bringing an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. This is speaking of how the sanctuary was no longer the dwelling place of God due to their rebellion, Daniel 8.13, eventually being destroyed in 70 AD. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of the prophecy speaks of the wrath of God that was poured out on Jesus for the sins of the world. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Keeping the 77s together and understanding that it's Jesus that confirms the covenant with the Jews makes this amazing prophecy much easier to understand. So where does America fit into all of this prophecy? America will be the prime enabler to this beast power we've been studying. As we learned earlier, the beast rising up out of the sea was symbolic for a power rising up out of a densely populated area. The waters you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. In contrast to water, we have land or earth. 
Earth represents a sparsely populated area with few people, nations, and languages. Here's the text. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. There's only one nation that sprang up in a sparsely populated area and has grown to be a world power strong enough to fit this description given in Revelation. The United States of America. Two horns like a lamb representing the Judeo-Christian principles on which America was founded. Lamb represents Christ, the Lamb of God in prophecy. America officially became an independent nation in 1776, around the time the first beast received its deadly wound. America is primarily Catholic. Over 25% of the American population claims Catholicism as their religion. Nearly all non-Catholic Christians the world over worship on Sunday as prescribed by the Catholic Church. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. America is also the only nation to use nuclear bombs in warfare. Nuclear bombs that were detonated in the sky and burned hot like the sun disintegrating everything within reach. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven in full view of men. Although a nuclear bomb could fit this prophecy, some believe this prophecy will be fulfilled in a more literal sense. Only time will tell. Sometime in the near future, due to catastrophic events, either natural or man-made, America will create a Sunday law, which it has done before, but this time there will be consequences for those who do not abide. that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. This means flushing much of the Constitution down the drain, so you can only imagine how bad things must get for this to come to pass. With the Verichip and other new technologies, tracking citizens and controlling their money will be easier than ever. And all this done under the guise of religious revival and likely national security as well. It's not difficult to see the similarities of America and the Vatican. Our government, our days of the week, our calendar, and even our clocks. We are in many ways an image and honor of the first beast already. Who gets marked in the end times according to Revelation? Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Everyone at the end will be marked. The righteous are marked with the seal of God in their forehead, and the wicked receive the mark of the beast in their forehead or right hand. This is not a physical mark, as many assume. It's a spiritual mark. The head representing an act of the heart or mind. The hand representing an act of works. Sounds like Cain and Abel all over again. 
You can see how in the near future, well-meaning Christians could actually push for legislation to make Sunday a universally recognized day of worship in contradiction to the Word of God. It may go virtually unnoticed if paired up with other conservative issues like stopping abortion and fighting to keep the Ten Commandments on display in public places. When legislation goes through, the majority of Christians will look at this as a huge victory for God. In actuality, it's a lawless step away from God. God is calling people back to the truth of His Holy Word, but we must do it willingly, not through force. God is cleansing His earthly sanctuary, the body of Christ, right now. Are you willing to go where He leads? Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Countless Christians the world over, due to their lack of understanding of the Bible, are caught up in this most deceptive of Satan's schemes. Soul-loving Christians living in rebellion to God's Word simply because they have refused to learn the Scriptures or have rejected its meaning. My people are destroyed uh, from lack of knowledge. The idea of Christians avoiding the tribulation by a secret rapture sounds nice, but this is a fairly new theory that has been popularized by books and movies in recent years. The fact is, Jesus will save us through the tribulation, not from it. Only those who take a stand on God's holy word will avoid receiving the horrible plagues. Persecution will be greater than any time in history, but Jesus will give us strength to endure. Christians should begin preparing now. Note that a church is symbolized by a woman in prophecy. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet. Babylon the Great. Babylon will never exist again. So this must refer to the meaning of the word, confusion. Mother would refer to the fact that they are the mother church. Prostitute daughters would then refer to Protestant churches who never fully abandon unbiblical Catholic teaching. Sunday worshipers worship on Sunday for one reason. The Catholic Church changed it. Drunk with the blood of the saints is referring to the countless Protestants that were killed at the hand of the Catholic Church. Whoa. Woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. The fact is, the dragon, Satan, has indeed led the whole world astray through the work of the church. Through a little compromise here and there over nearly two millennia of time, we have drifted far away from how the apostles believed and worshipped. From worshipping and bowing down to statues of saints, praying to dead saints, praying for dead loved ones, reciting repetitious prayers for sins, purchasing indulgences, changing the day of worship, trusted religious leaders molesting innocent children, and others in the church covering it up. Adultery and homosexuality becoming more acceptable in the church, even amongst leaders. You can see how the vision given to Daniel troubled him to the point of being sick for days. All of this with the slaughter of millions of Christians, pagan beliefs prominent in the church, and the exaltation of mere man over holy God must have been a lot to take in. To top it all off, the majority of Christians are completely blind to all that is happening. Others are simply silent. Thank you so much for taking the time to view this video. I know it's a lot to take in. Please prayerfully consider what you've seen and heard today, 
and ask God to help you discern the truth in these matters. There's so much more that could be said. Hopefully this video has given you a renewed hunger to search the scriptures for yourself. God bless all who are watching this. Here are some resources to help you get started on your journey for truth.